get one vote, please? Otherwise, that's all I, if you need coal or steel, see me. We have some of both out in the container. And that's all I've got. It's all you, Ralph. Let me verify really quick that we're live. Are we live? Are we live? Well, while we're seeing if we're live today, thank you all for coming. I know you'd a whole lot rather see Mike, but uh, we'll get through this. decided to do today is this little three-legged candle stand like sitting on the uh, anvil here uh, as near as I can figure about four years ago uh, the people at Athens State was asking Travis and I to come up with a little more advanced project for people that had taken uh, our earlier classes and this was the project that we come up with uh, a little three-legged candle holder uh, I'm sure we've all read articles and seen articles about making something like this. Uh, I may approach it a little bit differently because, uh, again, this was a project that was developed for the Athens State classes. It was a project we wanted everybody to be able to get through in one day. So some of the material I started, we started with, we had done some some advanced work too, uh, and I'm going to use some of that material today to, to kind of speed us along through it. The biggest thing to me on these candle holders has always been the three legs. Now, you may read an article and it will talk about uh, forging all three legs separately and then welding them together, and that's a way to do it. I've seen articles written where the people have forged two of the legs on one piece, bent them to their 120 degree angle, and then forged a third leg and welded that onto it. And that's a way to do it, and all of those are acceptable. What we decided on for class was we started with a piece of quarter inch by one inch by 12 inch long flat stock. And to alleviate all the cutting, uh, all the hand slitting, we just, we cut these, we slid it in the middle, which will automatically form two of the legs. Uh, I guess I could set this up here while we're talking about it. This was the storyboard that we made for the class. So here, here's our piece of one, a quarter by one by 12. We necked it down about three, about three inches in, three and a half inches in, about a quarter of the, length, uh, of the length. And then we use this neck down portion to have the students draw out this third leg. So that's what we're starting with. Uh, I talked about slitting. You can slip this leg out hot. Here's some of the issues if you decide to do it that way. We're looking at our bar on the end. If you slid all from one side and come all the way down and cut through it, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a ragged area in here. That's extremely difficult, may even be impossible to get that metal all forged back in to where you don't develop a cold shut. Another way you might do it is to chisel in from both sides and meet in the, meet in the middle. No matter which method I've tried, I always wind up with a nasty rag here when it comes through, which is easily taken care of by just filing out. Uh, the way that we split this piece, we went ahead and just cut it in the saw. It's right in the center. They're not gonna, the, the students wouldn't lead, lose any material, and they've already got two legs basically formed. So what we're going to do then is heat this up and again, to kind of speed things along, I'll real, real quickly run over to the power hammer and draw that out to length. 
after you get it drawn to length, your next step is to separate your legs and form those. Um, Three-legged candle stand, the legs are almost always at 120 degrees. That's the stablest configuration you're going to have for anything. If you make a three-legged stool, there's a center mark someplace, and those legs are just about 120 degrees. Yep. Travis has just finished working on his, or is still working on his tool over here. So you put a line, now this was a little bit different, so we won't go there. <laughs> All right, you get your legs configured, and you can, uh, what I've done, I've drawn out, uh, the other day I went down to Constitution Hall and I did all the drawing and I separated the legs and I've got them roughly at 120 degrees. So what we're going to do is blast through these three steps and then I've got the piece I did the other day here. Uh, so we won't lose any time talking about that. When you get your legs drawn out, uh, the next step we wanted the class to do was to form uh, a penny foot on it. Uh, up till now we've been drawing, we've been bending. Uh, here we'll talk about some half face blows. Uh, that, you know we use in a lot of projects to offset them feet. Uh, then you got to bend your legs. Uh, and other than the hole here in the center, uh, your legs are done. It's stable. Next step then is going to be to I'll, I'll heat it up. We're going to heat it up here and put it in a vise and spread them apart. And again, this is just I decided to do that like this today to, uh, to save some time rather than do it all by hand. When we were talking about this project, when I run this by Travis about using that for this demo, uh, you know, this might be a little a nice Christmas present. You know, for it, for some of you to do. That's one of the reasons that I I wrote my stock list out here on the top, so you can, so you'll have all that information. How far along <laughs> say you did the bandsaw cut? Uh, I did the bandsaw cut about eight inches, if I recall. Actually, that was. Uh, that bandsaw cut is six and a half. I thought that I, that man, I may have cut that off a little bit because we're gonna. Uh, oh, but I'll make it. Six and a half or seven. Steve. Okay. One of the other things we did for class. Uh, and I've got this drawn on the anvil. Was you know I made this jig so that the students could you know check and see which direction they needed to go with. Okay, so I've got my heat isolated right there at the union of the three pieces. 
Another thing, this project, the day we did it for Athens State, was all done in the little two brick gas forges that we used. And again, we talked about we talked about using those little forges for classes uh, to avoid all the fire maintenance and to avoid uh, people burning a piece up. So I'm going to get I'm going to get that joint warm again. I'm going to bring it over here to the vise. Uh, I'm going to start redefining that uh, that yoke here for the for the the legs come together. So how do you draw those out then to about 12 inches? When you draw that out? No, I, you, don't, you don't need, I mean, that's for this point. one, you don't need to draw out any more than about eight. Eight inches max? What, what, you, what you want to do, or what I, how I thought it needed to be done, is this drawn out leg, needs to wind up the same dimension this way and dimension this way. Okay, okay so I'm going to come back to my price. I'm going to lock my piece in here. And that's pretty close to what your three legs is. Uh, not quite 120 there, a little more there. So it needs a little bit more work. Uh, again, you have to work in this area, get them kicked out, you know, clean these edges up so, they're, so that they're nice and smooth. Uh, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. But if you keep it all on 120 degrees, you know, it's a stability thing. Uh, so, that's the way you start your legs. Now, I'm going to go to this piece I worked on the other day, and we'll talk about we'll talk about it a little bit. When you get your legs to the, you want that over here, Dave? You're good. Okay. When you get your legs drawn out to the 120 degrees, okay, you've got your you've got your inside sections here cleaned up. Then, if you'll take and put a mark in the center of each leg, two marks, down here and up here. Lay your scale on it and draw, the draw you a line across the center. That will give you the exact center of your pieces. Okay, and, it's, and that's kind of important because if you get your hole off, like I got this one off when I punched it the other day, uh, your legs aren't going to come out. But if you find the exact center of this piece, and you put a center punch mark on it, then measure from that center punch mark out, and that's where you cut all your legs. That way you've got your center, you've got every leg the same, you've got everything equal, and when you assemble your candle holder, everything's going to sit square and perpendicular. Will you show those marks to the... center punch marks that I've got now near the end of the legs is where I'm going to do the half face blows to start the feet. This one's already been cut off to the to the seven inches. Uh, punch your hole, drill your hole, put your hole in it any way you want to. Uh, again, since we did this for uh, a class project, this was a one day project, you know, as people would get to this stage then we would punch it and let them mark their legs, and we would go ahead and drill it out then to alleviate problems with that. Next step is to start working on your feet. 
the way Travis, well, the way Travis and I and the way any of us work, any project we do, no matter how complicated it is, whether it's a candle stand or whether it's our ring project out here or the tool stand that Travis made, you're using basic steps. Okay? You're drawing, you're bending, you're, uh, in some cases, twisting. You know, we use offset hammer blows in a lot of projects. Uh, the, if you learn to make a tool, uh, learn to make tongs, you're going to have to use half-face blows to make all your tongs. Uh, the class that Travis and I are, teach, are teaching next week for Athens State is going to be a little brush-like. A little rush candle holder and we're you know what we're throwing in there is if the students get through with that they will have also gone through the exact same steps they need to make a set of tongs. I got my marks on the end of my feet to draw out my penny legs my feet I'm going to come to the anvil. I'm going to lay my mark on the edge of Travis's anvil here. Take the second heat. I'm going to come over the offset, off edge of the anvil, and I'm just going to round that foot up a little bit. Well, and you, can, you, you started out by doing a half face, and yes. then you switched your feet to spread it out more, spread. Todd. Yes, okay. exactly. purpose of the center mark punch marks is so that you do every foot the same place so that you keep your legs the same length. How far did you put that punch mark up? It was just a, it was, uh, three quarters of an inch in from the end of the leg. <coughs> Remember, when you're working with coal, the thinner the material is, the faster it heats up. Maybe 
by the third one, I can get it looking like I want it to look. Belt sanders are wonderful things, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, while it's warming up, the next, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, where I've got these feet going, So there's our foot. I'm going to turn that foot up this way. At about 90 degrees. Okay, on going this way. That way this area is on the bottom. You can get a nice sharp inside corner here. And the inside corner is what everybody's going to see. Just like splitting the legs, there's different ways to do this. You can heat, you can, you know, I always have this leg bent up. I can heat the leg, I can put it in a vise, and I can bend it by hand with a hammer. Think uh, and, you know, if, if, when you do get to do enough of them or you just draw out the shape you want, that's a perfectly acceptable way to do it. Again, because this was for a class project, what we did was make just a simple little jig. Okay, I've got a, we welded a block in here so they can, they've got their candle legs formed and split out. They slide it right into this V, clamp down on it, bend it down, and if they've kept everything the same, then their, then their three-legged base is gonna be the same when they get under here. Again, take your time, back that foot up into your 
into your leg material so, so when it sits on the table, you've got a nice place for it to sit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do these other two the same, just at the same time before I, before I bend the legs. Always works out better if you bend all three feet the same way. Sets so on the table much nicer. don't have to do this over the edge of the anvil. You could hook, you could put your feet in the leg vise and bend them over that way if you're more comfortable with that. Those of you who have seen me demonstrate or been in some of my classes before, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll know when I say the way that you, there are right and way, wrong ways to do things. But the way that you work that's most comfortable for you, whether it be the shape of your hammer or the shape of your hammer handle or the weight of your tongs, uh, if you're comfortable with what you're working with, I believe your work's going to reflect that and it's going to look better. Or if you're fighting to do something somebody else's way all the time, uh, it doesn't always work very well. Or at least it never worked out real well for me. But then there are teachers all over the country that can give you reports on Al Stevens' uh, scholarly attributes there. Alright, so I'm going to heat this leg up. I'm going to bring it over to my jig, I'm going to clamp it my jig, I'm going to bring it down and pull it tight, and all three of those legs will be the same. <coughs> There's your first leg. You just butted the, the center of the I just butted the center, of the, the, the center point against this locating block. So it's going to be located the same place every time. Every time.
Now, as you can see on this piece, these legs are, are very plain. We've just forged them out and formed them. There's all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of, just like there was different ways to, to make a three-legged base, uh, you can get as decorative with them as you like. I've made bases with a basic uh, hinge, hinge shot, uh, like a long taper with a ball on the end of it that I've domed out a little bit. Adds a different dimension. You know, we've talked about light reflecting off of different surfaces. A leg like this, you could very easily do some, uh, you could file a bevel on either side of each leg. It would dress it up a little bit more. Uh, you could do some punch works on, on your legs that would dress them up a little bit more. Um, combination of punch and file work. Uh, just, you know, anything you can imagine that you can fill up that space with decoration, you can do. Do it before you bend it. Have all that done first. You know, some of the filing that you knife guys do on the back edge of your blades would look very nice on you. No, but I'm sure the FBI will tell you that later. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think last I think last Halloween Dave put they put a slow burning fire and uh, slowed down signs on the on the web page, didn't you? Yeah, there was a I caught the fire as like a right as it was starting up in a slow-mo camera shot. And it had this, because of the, the sucker pulling off everything out, it made this really weird humming sound. And it was like summoning a demon or something. It's on the, uh, the AFC webpage. Like you could use it as background for a haunted house. It's pretty creepy. <coughs>
I've been doing some work down at Constitution Hall in Huntsville, and you know all the regular park personnel down there. You know when they bring the school group through, you know they always say that the blacksmith shop was one of the favorite places. Mm -hmm. yeah. I honestly I believe that part of it is you know the kids can so see somebody doing stuff with fire. And, you know, they don't get the danger lecture all the time. <coughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I was watching a movie the other day, and this, this guy in there was described as having limited social skills, and she just looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> All right, so here's our three-legged candle stand. Uh, that looks like that may need a little adjusting, but that's pretty well it from begin to end, from you know beginning to end. Now, again, if you want to take some time, do some file work on your legs. Uh, my feet aren't as perfectly round as I would have liked for them to be, despite burning the one up. You can clean that up, but you're basically done with your legs. At this point. Well, Al, that's how you know it wasn't machine manufactured. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but now, you know, yes. to, to address that point, for years and years, I've tried to make people understand, uh, not entirely successfully in many cases, that just because something is handmade does not mean it has to look rough. And be done. You know, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> and made and homemade ain't the same thing. <laughs> All right. Now, for me, the next most difficult part of this project uh, is the cage. Can you see that, Dave? I call this the cage here. Uh, it's going to hold our candle holder. It's going to have a spring attached to it. You've got to put two holes that line up so that everything looks perpendicular and straight and square when you get done. So there's not hard work involved to it, but there's some, there's some work that you kind of need to pay attention to. Uh, again, we're starting this, uh, and we, we designed this project to do it out of material that anybody could find. Uh, the cage is made out of a piece of 3 8 round stock, uh, 10 inches long. The purpose for our class of doing it this way Again, because most of the people in our class have normally taken some classes before, but they were still, uh, you know, still fairly well beginners. To turn this piece of 3 8 round into a piece of flat stock, uh, you've got to draw it out. You know, drawing is a, one of the most basic things we all do, and we do it on every, every project as we had them drawing this piece out, you know, we urged them to work on the dimensions of that piece, both thickness-wise and width-wise. You know, the length's kind of flexible. We, we didn't worry too much about the length. in the hammer. Uh, basically this 10 inch piece here when you get it drawn out to about 3 16 thick uh, it will magically be about a half inch wide. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and do that.
Now again, keep in mind, we were doing this as a class project, as a, as a project for Athens Sport, or Athens State College. No matter where you're at in this blacksmithing journey of yours, okay, whether it's your, it's your first time doing something, or you've done it as long as Travis has done it, you know. The only way you develop speed and skill is by practice. You're not going to walk up to the anvil once every six months and produce the quality work that Travis does because Travis is in here every day. You know, you're not going to walk in here, you're not going to walk up to your forge once every six months or one Saturday a month and have the speed that Travis has. Well, you just, those are things that you have to develop. There is no, there are no YouTube video or book or advice is going to learn you as much as doing it. Another, another little cautionary thing. If you can't do it here, you can't do it over there. That'll just help you mess it up faster. <laughs> so <laughs> learn to do it here. All right, let's see. John asked how long that was. That 10-inch piece wound up about just a shade over 12, which will give you plenty of length to do The rest of it. Just, that, that, that was just a, how much did you grow? Well, if I started with a 10 inch piece and it grew to 12 inches, how much did we grow? Two inches. 20%. All right, next step. Uh, again, another basic, another basic step. We're gonna, we're gonna punch some holes in there. We need two holes that are spread out enough to do your to pass your upright through we need a hole for the rivet to rivet your candle cup assembly onto this cage remember we drilled them. Travis, do you remember how we did it that day? We drilled them in the class. Did we drill them in the class? Alright. Uh, it looks better punched though. Well, yeah, they look better punched. Um, You're going to punch them. I'm going to punch them? Yeah. I'm going to punch them. <laughs> and if all goes wrong, I've already got one punched. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've talked about punching holes before. If you're drilling them, you put the drill bit in the bliss, you know, in the drill press, you zip down through there and you've got a hole, you've lost whatever the diameter of that hole is and the thickness of your piece of material. As blacksmiths, when we punch a hole, the vast majority of that material will be pushed out uh, into the piece so we don't, we don't lose that mass. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to start from one side, I'm going to drive my punch down through it. I'm going to feel my punch bottom out on the anvil. I'll turn the piece over and I'll look for that dark shiny spot and that'll be the bottom of my hole and I'll bring it over here and I'll clear the hole out. And the next, 
The next question is how far apart are these first two big ones? We'll get there. We'll get I'm there. asking too many questions. No, you're not. No, you're not, because somebody else is thinking the same thing. First hole I'm going to put in is the rivet hole. We try to get it in the center. Always wear leather shoes in the blacksmith shop. That way when something falls off and lands on your foot, it doesn't set your tennis shoe. Mr. Pansler. Yeah, you know, sometimes. <laughs> So here's our hole. Here's our <laughs> hole to attach our candle holder part. I'm going to turn this around. And I'm going to do the same thing basically on the other end. While you're heating that up, Al, can you point out on the, the piece over here, um, the, the finished piece, the one you just did? Okay. The hole that I just did is the hole that we will rivet our candle cup assembly onto our cage with. On your bar that you're making, that will be down at that very end. Now, I'm going to go to the other end, and I'm going to basically do the same thing, but then I'm going to stretch it out a little bit uh, to accept my upright. And there's different ways to do that too. I'm going to come in a little bit farther in from the edge. So now I've got another approximately 3 sixteenths hole. Then I'm going to heat up. And because when I made my punch, I drew it out to a taper. Remember our, our drawing square octagonal round. I can use this same punch to drift out a hole almost a half inch in diameter if I want to. Which is all I'm going to do here. I'm just going to keep pushing it down through that hole and stretching it out until I get uh, until I get to the point that my 3 eighths rod will go through there. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about that other one. Different ways to do this. You can like I said, drift it out like I'm like I'm doing here. Just well, that'd be so much easier if I pull off that. Let me heat it up a little bit. When we punched all the holes for the ring projects out here, we put a slot in the bar where we was going to have a round hole that was the same size as our diameter. And then from that slot, then we run a drift down through there to open up the holes that we want. You can do it that way. Uh, we actually used a slot punch uh, that Travis had made. You can. You know, make a slitted chisel. You know, use a use a slitted chisel to achieve that dimension.
I tend to do things this way because I've significantly reduced the size and the amount of tools that I've got uh, for the past four months while I've been building a house. When I wanted to do some forging, I'd fire my little two brick forge up on either my mother-in-law's patio or uh, I did it in the garage, in my garage the other day to do a little practicing from this. Uh, so then, again, this is a project that you can do with relatively few tools. you want to do that you could put your drift back through there you know and round this up real nice you can file it off you can belt sand it off uh, you can leave it that way if you want all right John asked a little while ago about uh, where to locate this second hole this is a little bit critical so I'm going to refer to my notes I think when I did it the other day I just held it up to the storyboard and kind of I had, I, I, can you hold it for a second? I, uh, I wrote down six and three eighths in from the end. Uh, and you are, you or anyone else, you are more than welcome to come up and use this storyboard. Because off of the center line of these holes, you're going to determine where your bend marks are. And you're going to have to leave enough space in here for your spring to operate. Because the spring is what holds it in place going up and down. So we'll get to that in a minute. Matter of fact, oh, it's only 2 o'clock. Yes, if I stuck my piece in there, it would get hot faster. Is there any water out there? Dave, is there any water out there? No? There was some on the face. The faucet, faucet water will be fine, Dave. We'll take the table right back there with some bottle water. Oh, yeah, we got one out. Okay, how, how the hell is it out? Six and three quarters center to center. Is what that is? Yes, sir. Okay, I think I had six and three eighths down, but. Three eighths and a quarter. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a. You just turn
put that on that thing to do. While you're standing up here, you hold it piece when you want. Put your hold. actually come back and been in several Travisized classes, so he's also a glutton for punishment. Okay, so we've got we've got our hole started. Now talk about a little something else. You can see that when I punched that hole, I got just a little bit of off center on it. Okay, which will could create me a problem if I'm just spreading this hole out with my punch. I don't think I'm far enough off that it is, but here's a solution. If you do that, if you punch a hole and you find you've done that, when you get ready to spread your hole out, pick up your little, your little squirt water bottle or whatever's around, and if you cool the thin side of that hole, that's gonna push it all out the other way. Because the cold side's not gonna move as much as the hot side. So there's a fix for that. <laughs> Not that I've ever had to do that. Somebody told you about that. I heard Travis told me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw it on YouTube. <laughs> Like the knife blade I was given the other day by a friend and run over by a truck and had kind of a nice curve to it. And he asked me if What know YouTube when you learned that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Spencer, for bringing that point up. <laughs> You're right though. Woo! Boy, hard crowd today. I'm telling you. No mercy. Did I learn that from you, Clay? Clay, Clay's staying out of this. He said, I don't want my name associated with this mess at all. I think my old buddy Doug told me about that one day. No doubt when I had punched something off center and started to throw it away, and he said, no, we can still use that. Ah, oh, but one more heat will. And, and one last annoying question, Al. No, go ahead. What did you make the punch out of? The, th this punch is made out of S7. Uh, I tend to make all of my tools either out of a, uh, S7 or uh, H13. Uh, I don't have to go through any hardening and tempering games with them. They hold up. They hold up pretty well. Uh, what was it? Somewhere, I think Travis told me. You know, most people say, you know, you make a you make a slitter or a punch out of H13, and you make a drift out of S7. So,
we've got a hole uh, that our upright will go through. one down here with this other piece. I'll figure out what I done with the first one I made. Okay. Alright, here's you know here's the piece we just forged as opposed to the heat I made down the other day. Looks like Travis's hammer stretched it out a little more than I did. So we're gonna we're gonna go to this we're gonna go to this cold piece now just for the sake of speed. Here's the most critical dimension. Like I said, you need, if you want your cage, you know, to show up being perpendicular to your shaft, then these bends have to be the same uh, distance from the center of your holes, these two holes, because if not, you know, then your cage is going to be kicked out this way or this way, or and you won't have you won't have uh, uh, an opportunity to spring it. <coughs> so this is really the most critical dimension on the piece. Uh, this one, let's see, I we laid out to be uh, eight and a half about an inch and a quarter. An inch and a quarter from the center line of your hole to where your bend's going to be. Same way on this other side, from the center line of the hole to where your bend's going to be. You can see I've, I've gone ahead and I've marked, uh, I put a punch mark on there where, where those are going to be. I'm just going to do them in a vise. If you're, you can do them offhand on the <coughs> anvil. It works better for me in something like this in the vise. You'll also notice that on this piece, I went ahead and I drilled the two holes where my spring was going to be. Uh, nothing uh, necessary about those dimensions. I just left them about a half inch apart. So I'm going to get this warm. Bring it over here, put it in the vise, and, and bend it over to 90 degrees. Got my piece straight up and down in the vise, so my bend's gonna be square. Okay, so there's the bottom of our cage.
because that's what I'm going to burn in that hole. I'll hit it down here. in measuring your pieces and punching your holes, then it will go on your upright like that. And be felt relatively parallel. Okay? I love it when a plane comes together. <laughs> now you just jinx it. Uh, yeah, jinx it. <laughs> no doubt. All right, so other than other than putting the attaching the spring to that you're done with your cage and your candle cup unless you know unless you want to do some decoration on it and that's fine too and again you know at this point uh, is when you you need to think about your decoration and what you want to do uh, you may want to uh, I think on this one, uh, I wound up putting my touch mark back here. But the same things that we talked about doing the file work on the legs would go to this cage. And I mean, if you just really want to get serious about your file work, file the whole thing and wind up with a nice, a nice polished candle holder. Uh, I've seen them both ways. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, I went ahead and put the, put the holes in here uh, for my spring. So let's just go ahead and do, a, I think, do the spring real quick. All right, your spring, as you can see on the board there, is a piece of 3 16 round stock, 3 inches long. turn that piece of material into our spring. This is going to be a real simple spring. Uh, it's not going to be hardened or, or tempered or anything at all. Uh, for what we're doing here, I don't believe it needs to be. That one was made, I think, in uh, uh, 15, and it's, it's never been anything done to that. All basically I'm going to do is flatten this out, flatten my spring out into kind of a long taper. I'll hold this dimension here this way. Uh, old <coughs> diving boards, wooden diving boards, back when they were first invented, when clay was just a wee lad, <laughs> was just a tapered board. May not have been tapered even, but a tapered wooden diving board will act just like a modern springboard does. So that's where you're going to pick up some of the spring here. I like how you keep making all these old jokes like you weren't around. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't around when Clay was a boy. <laughs>
spread that out or just flatten it down and it will naturally spread out to about a little quarter inch thick wide maybe a little wider uh, you reduce the thickness of it down quite a bit into my hammer or use a ball peen and just spread that out just a little bit wider that way I can cup it a little bit and it'll fit your upright a little better and give you a little more uh, a little more bite on it. And to put that nice little Depression in it, you can come over to your vise, get the peen into your hammer, and now you've got to fit your upright. Okay? Now, as a matter of fact, you can even take, even at this heat. Any further adjustment that needs to be done, uh, you can do down the line. Can you see that, Dave? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's see. We've made legs, cage, <coughs> spring, <laughs> upright. Right, we'll start with uh, a piece of a piece of three eighths by eighteen. Uh, the most critical part of it on the end here is about a 3 16 tenon to go down through the hole in our legs to set our can holder. We've talked about different ways to do, uh, do the legs. There's you know, different ways to do things. There's different ways to do a tenon on a piece. If you've got uh, access to a lathe, you know, you put it in a lathe, you turn a little tenon, and that'll be fine. Uh, you can uh, draw a tenon out by freehand, and then file the tip, and that'll be fine too. Um, what we'll do here, in fact, I'm going to do it with one of these pieces. If we, if we take our upright, it's going to be 18 inches long. You know, you're just going to draw this to kind of a nice, graceful taper on one end. I've seen, now, now it's not necessary. <laughs> I've seen candle holders where, you know, it just comes up and dubs off square. I've seen candle holders that, you know, have just a, a taper to them. I've seen candle holders uh, that even have a little shepherd's crook in the top of them so that you can, you have the option of hanging that candle holder if you want to. Uh, and those are all options. What we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to talk a little about this little faceted ball that I kind of fell in love with when I was in Pennsylvania because I, I, I just it seemed like I ran into it everywhere. Uh, so I just started putting it on things. Uh, you guys have watched me put it on the ends of tongs, and you will see, you will find it on. Tools, you'll find it as a decorative finial on a project like this. I've seen it a lot on old iron pump handles. I've seen it on andirons. Uh, it's just, 
I just think it is an attractive picture. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So while that's kind of building back up, we'll talk about fire maintenance a little bit if you're working in coal. Unlike our nice little gas forges that we just turn on and you know, don't really think too much about, coal fire or certain maintenance to it. You know, you've got to keep putting fresh fuel into it down from the sides or coking up. You need to clean the clinkers out. You know, you need to make sure your, your air coming through it good. Uh, all those reasons are reasonable, some of the reasons why Travis and I always use the, the gas forces in class, because it eliminates uh, the necessity of that work. Uh, as you've almost seen me do here on several occasions, uh, it's very easy not to pay attention to what you're doing and burn a piece up. And then your only option is to start over. But, what about tenants? Uh, We'll just pretend that I've already drawn this out to this nice taper, uh, and we all, we've all seen drawing done before. I'm going to start working on this other end here. Uh, the way I decided to do <coughs> this taper today, or this tenon today, is I'm going to start on the end of my piece and just, oh, 3 16 or a quarter inch in, I'm going to put a line all the way around it. That's going to create that's going to create my shoulder. Okay, that's going to create my shoulder here. I'm going to do a little bit of drawing. I'm going to go from round to square to octagonal to round. But then I've got another little tool that I made uh, that's easily made. Uh, it's what we used in classes uh, to help finish off that tenon, and we'll talk about We'll talk about it some. Now, I have not gone down to my any size, but I've got a nice little cut started around that. <coughs> we talked about practicing things. When you get to hammering on a small piece, you know, where you have to be real careful with your blows, again, the only way you're going to get good at that, and I've seen some people that are very good at that, is to practice it. Do it all the time. I am woefully out of practice. We'll do the best job we can do. Got that nick right on the edge of Travis's anvil. More comfortable with a smaller hammer, use a smaller hammer, you know, when you get in, get in some, a tight place like that. Video. 
of us, many members of the Athens Forge here, you know, here several years ago, we went through a process, we went through a program where we built the Smith and Magicians. Okay, it's a guillotine tool. Uh, very, very handy, very popular. Uh, I hope I've still got one somewhere. <laughs> I'll find out here shortly. Uh, but this is the same thing. This is just a couple of little blocks that I put a, 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 a pivot on, weld it together. I've got a hole drilled in it for 3 16 diameter shaft. I'm going to put my piece of metal in there and hammer down, hammer it, and round it up. Uh, and then we'll talk about another little tool. Clay's made some real nice little tools like this that uh, uh, to be used under power hammers. So if you ever get the app, the opportunity to take Clay's power hammer class, that's probably one of the things he'll talk to you about. Like I said, I got this one way off center. And I don't know if I can straighten it out or not. It'll, it'll serve for demonstration purposes uh, <coughs> today. And what I'll do if I don't, uh, I mean, I, I don't expect you all to stand here until we get this completely done today, but uh, I'll get this done between now and our next iron and a half, and there'll be one in the iron and a half. Uh, and it, incidentally, just as a just as a plug, our last iron in the hat, uh, the Athens Forge decided to to donate the proceeds of that iron in the hat uh, to Richie Cruz, who's having some medical issues. How much did we wind up sending over, Travis? Thousand dollars. Thank you all very much. Uh, I can't think of a better a better use for money like that to be spent on. Clay showing me one of the tools that he does for his power hammer class where you can nick it and you can size it and you can finish it all in the same tool. Don't you do one like that for, yeah, for, for yeah. tenons like this? Yeah, that's what he's got three, yeah. three stations in it. Now, I will say uh, these, this one of mine was just made out of mild steel. That's what I had laying around the shop. Uh, I don't use it. I never use it much in my work, in my regular work. So I didn't make it out of a better piece of steel. But here is our 316th tenon off of a piece of 3 8 round. Now we'll do one other. We're going to do one other operation uh, <coughs> to this. That's 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 obviously way longer than we need because we only need a quarter inch. So I'm going to cut part of that off. Uh, but for me, at least, if I try to forge things down, you know, very much smaller than that, they, they all wind up in a scrap pile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that off approximately to the length. Uh, I need, uh, you know, it'll be maybe three eighths, and then we're going to talk about another little very useful tool <coughs> when you do things like this. Well, okay, I'll hit the piece. Hey, Al. 
Sir. Susan wants me to tell you hi. She's watching on YouTube. Who? Susan. Susan. Hello, Susan. You should be here. I can't pronounce her last name. <laughs> yeah, nobody can pronounce Susan's last name. <laughs> All right. Another little tool that's real handy when you go to make the tip. This is a monkey tool. It was just a three-quarter inch block of mild steel that I drilled a 3 16th hole in. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring our, our upright out. I'm going to lock it in the vise. I'm going to stick this monkey tool down over the end of it, and I'm going to drive it up into my mass. And that's going to produce a square corner, which when you're joining two things together, you need. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Why is it called a monkey tool? <laughs> because Francis Whitaker said you needed a monkey to pick one up after you drop it on the floor all the time. <laughs> because I never could afford my own monkey, I make, my, I make my stuff out of square so they don't roll off the anvil. I'm sure Francis thought of that at some point, Clay. I've never heard of him. That why it's called. <laughs> that was the explanation I heard him use. Okay, that's I believe it was at, at uh, Sloss Furnace in 88. That's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next iron in the hat is for a monkey for Al. <laughs> no, I got no room for a monkey anymore. Said, as I said, you drive that on there and you produce a square corner, or if you've got a cold shut in it, you break it off and you can't show people how that works. So we'll move on to the next part of this. And I'll clean my monkey tool out later. Oh, mercy. It always screws up in the demo. <laughs> Something, yeah. Don't worry, but, it's only live and recorded that's for right, all eternity. Going worldwide. Okay, don't do it that way. But there's what's left of my tent. Uh, so here's one that I practiced on the other day. Obviously, I should have practiced that a little bit more. All right, so our upright has a tenon on it. We've drawn it to a taper. We've got... Our legs made, we've got our cage made, we've got our spring made, we've got our upright made. Let's talk about this candle pan a little bit. Uh, inch diameter circle. I think I've got 16 gauge wrote down there. Uh, that's not carved in stone. That's just the material that I had around. When Travis and I done this project uh, for Athens State, uh, another thing that I had laying around was some one inch tube and that's how we used uh, what we used for these two pieces. Now uh, my one inch tube has all since has long since disappeared and we're gonna solder this on here. So what I thought I would show you today is, again, since all of us don't have, you know, the nice shop Travis has, uh, and once upon a time I had all the appropriate size mandrels and everything, is how to make this candle cup out of a piece of flat stock. Now this just happens to be a 16 gauge uh, flat stock from some pieces that I had laying around. Uh, once upon a time I had a bandsaw. I don't have a bandsaw anymore, or it's not hooked up right now. Uh, so I just cold cut this out of a sheet. If you don't have any sheet to cut something out of, another option is to make your own sheet. Okay. 
this piece of about let's see one two three four five five by three inch sheet was spread out of a piece of half inch square material just as an example, just seeing how much I could move that material. So if you don't have anything like this, spread your sheet out. Take your cold chisel, lay it out, file your edges, and then you've got a piece of material to start your to start your candle color. Uh, and you can do them flat. Uh, I've seen somewhere along the line. You know, people have talked about making candle holders to rivet on that are made with a sheet like this. You roll your candle cup, you fold this piece up, and you've got a hole to rivet it together. Uh, most of them, the bottom's not quite that nice and round. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of like the feet. Most of them probably look like the feet on my legs here. Closer. But another way to do this is just with a flat sheet. Uh, we're going to form it into a cup, and then we're going to we're going to braise it on to our. We're going to form it into and uh, braise it onto our pan. Now, once upon a time. Before I started moving and packed everything away, I had six inch pieces of all different size material. Okay, well, if they're still there, I have not found them yet. So, what I'm gonna do is roll this piece of material around a three quarter inch sock. Okay? And I'm gonna come to my vise and I'm gonna Put my socket in here, and I'm going to put my piece of metal in here, and I'm going to keep everything as perpendicular as I can. Steve taking pictures. You all may have to endure this again in the camera glow of these days. Camera glow? Or bits. The bits. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, the other one, too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I can't wait for it to come in every month because I learned a lot from it. I love it. I think we can learn a lot from it. Okay, now, I could have taken that down just Use just a smidge and smaller socket. So I'm using my vise. It's kind of a little forming press here. Just kind of Watch lumping that together. Watch the thumbs, Carol says. <coughs> No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd really come out good. <laughs> now, and if you're real careful, when you start that, it winds up square and you don't have to adjust it too much. But, inch tube laying around and you want to make a candle cup, that's the way what I went about doing it. They say poor boys got poor ways, right? Good. Now, we are going to affix our candle cup to our pan. And we're going to solder this pan to this cup. And 
know I got a cup. My pans, my pans already got a, uh, a 316 hole in it. It's already been formed out a little bit. Uh, so basically what we're going to do, we're going to set our cup onto our pan, and we're going to braise them in the fire. Uh, when I, before I had started blasting, I was, at, I was visiting as a tourist the shop that I eventually uh, started doing a lot of volunteer work in. And the blacksmith there had been working on, a, he was working on a chandelier, I think. And when he got to making his, his candle cup assemblies, he got everything together and he laid it in his forge and he started heating it up and there was nobody else in the shop. And he pointed to me, oh, it was easy to find. I'd been there about four days hanging over the rail at this point. And he says, come here, look at this. And as I bent down to look in that candle cup, that brass melted. It was just magic. I was lost, you know. That, that instant led to death. burn a little bit more. A couple of tricks that seem to have worked for me over the years, and I can't tell you who taught them to me now, but when you're going to braise things like this together, if you will take your candle cup and lay it down on your pan and take your graphite pencil and draw a circle around it. I can't explain why, but that graphite creates a dam and it keeps your silver solder from being, or your solder from being sucked out to the edge of your pan. Solder won't adhere to the graphite, maybe. Okay. So John says solder won't adhere to the graphite. I just said maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the explanation. No, that's, I know. Is that is that it? Yeah. I do know this one time. I had I had. Uh, and I don't know that I've ever tried to duplicate this. But I had a piece of steel and I was just playing around, and I uh, I wrote my name on this flat piece of steel with a graphite pencil. Heated it up, and even after scaling. You can read my name on that piece. So just may have been a flute thing. Uh, what I've got in here is some little, oh, I've got a little bit of flux in here. I've got a little bit of silver solder in here. I'm gonna wet my handle cup and stick it down in this little handy, handy thing of flux that I carry around with me, and I'm going to set it right down on my circle. Okay, also in my little tin that I keep in here, normally there's some little pieces of brazing rod. I think I'll use these others. Just, you know, we used to be able to buy brazing rod, you know, at about any hardware store, I'm sure, probably tractor supply has it, but I've got this little baggie here that I've just cut up some little pieces of brazing rod in. So Al, you're using solid core solder, not resin core, correct? The, no, well, no, this this is not a solder, this is a brazing rod. Oh, you use the word, no, you're talking about I, Yeah, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll do that, just <coughs> don't, don't mind me, Carol. Okay, never mind, my bad. <laughs> and I'm just gonna drop couple pieces down in there and try to get them to stick up against the edge and not fall through the hole. This is a delicate operation. 
Yeah, we all know how good Al is with delicate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I picked up multiple pieces. <coughs> Al, will the pencil work on top? I don't know. Or his other life is a brain to be, to be perfectly honest, Travis, I don't know. It'd be worth it'd be worth a it'd be worth to try to play with. Just for insurance, I am going to drop a little piece of silver solder down in here. It may stay in place a little bit better than my other solder, my other raising rod. Okay. Now we're gonna. This is and this is this is really, this is really <laughs> critical and delicate. You've got to get this from here to the fire without you know messing everything up. Whatever you do. The one that yeah, whatever I do, don't sneeze or trip or anything. The one that I practiced on the other day down at Constitution Hall, I did not get square. <coughs> Johanna pointed that out to me, <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, that'll be all right. Yeah, Joanna. Joanna. <laughs> that person who was with me the other day. <laughs> and then you just set it, you just set it in your fire. Now, if you're, and we're going to just barely turn this fire on a little bit to kind of bump it up slow. Here's what we're going to see. You're going to see your fire, and this works much easier with a bellows, much more control. But we're going to see our fire heat up our pan. Pan's going to get red. That heat's going to kind of transfer up into the tube. It's going to melt the flux. It's going to melt the solder. And you're done. And then you very carefully pull it out and dip it in water. Now, another uh, 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 other ways to do this, when we did it in the class, we uh, set it up in the vise and used Travis's torch uh, and just heated it up from the bottom and it basically did the same thing. We've done that here. I think in the past we demonstrated on, on the big ports. You get your gas forge hot and then put it in stern dollars. You know, I, the yeah. only ones that I have ever, I don't know if that would keep enough heat, Clay. That'd be something to try. He's shaking his head. Steve's saying, yeah. I've, I've, okay. I've done all my brains keys. Okay, all right, there we go. Uh, I never have tried it that way. The ones the ones that I have tried in the gas forge, I've probably left in there too long, and I've sucked brazing rod all the way to the outside edge of them, which, I mean, structurally, it doesn't bother anything. But I, I, I like, I normally like for them to be a little bit cleaner than that. <coughs> Okay, I see my flux starting to melt. And there I believe the brazing rod has melted. See the shiny line there? You see the shiny line? No, I know what I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, now I think I see the shiny coming out. Yeah, I know I see something out there. So I'm going to let that sit, and I'm going to very carefully try to get that down in Travis's slack tub. Let me see if I can find something a little. Candle cup, braised to our candle pan. 
Okay, we've got, I guess we've got all the pieces made. What about riveting your spring? Or attaching your spring to the cage? Okay, we haven't done that yet. You got it made, but you don't have a set. I do. Help, but I'm, a, I'm addicted to live PD. You know, you always see people, they find people with these little plastic bags all throughout their car, and the policeman always asks them what that's for. I have never <coughs> heard one say that that's what I hold my little forged parts in, but uh, hopefully I can call on all of you to bail me out at some point. <laughs> and and, and Ann's got my bag, she said. <laughs> are just uh, <coughs> these are just simple uh, little one eight rivets. Like I said, I I, I pre-drilled this piece the other day. Uh, store bought rivets. Yes, store bought rivets. Al does not make his own rivets. He, he, <laughs> Failure, JC's. That's the only explanation I can possibly make. No, wait a minute, I gotta put a spring in there. <laughs> Duh! Do you use 8 inch? Yes, the standard 8 inch. 8 by 3 inch? Yeah, 8 by a quarter will be fine. The nice thing about buying rivets, if you don't use a lot of them, I would recommend buying a longer rivet. That way, you can cut them off and make shorter rivets out of them. And it's infinitely easier than making a short rivet to begin with. I have found. was in there a minute ago, Steve. <laughs> we may have to put one in for visual purposes and then uh, clean that hole up a little bit. Doesn't take a whole lot to hold that spring in there. <coughs> Put your rivet through. So you, then you need to adjust your rivet, your spring, <coughs> just so that you've got a little tension on your upright. Doesn't have to be much. Ah. 
And now, you've got your cage, you've got your upright, you've got your spring put in. Uh, again, you don't, it's not necessary to use uh, spring type material. Uh, that spring was just made out of mild steel. Uh, if you just feel you have to do something with it when you get it all drilled and that, heat it up and quench it. And that'll add a little toughness to it. But that's going to hold about anything you want to. Okay, has everybody seen the, uh, the, candle, cu the candle cup assembly, right? All right, so then what's left is we take our candle cup assembly and we grab us a little 3 8 rivet or I'm sorry 3 16 rivet maybe 3 16 long see if I've got one a little longer than that it should be enough easiest way, if you can get your hands down in there, that i found at least, is to put my rivet down through my hole. Yes, yes. So when you guys get me a monkey, you need one hand with little bitty tiny fingers on it. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear about this conversation. <laughs> I just feel it coming. <laughs> Here's your name those flowers. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Clay, my man. Oh. Boy, that works out wonderful. That's a little monkey finger. Yeah. <laughs> thought of something else. Then I get it down in there. I think Travis has been cheating and using these pliers to make little bitty scrolls with because the ends of them are rounded off. I've got a pair like that. Huh? I've got a <laughs> Travis, you got any, uh, you got a piece of half inch round no. stuff? No. What? No, no, I didn't get it. I'm going to no. do it another way. I don't know if these will fit in there. No, I don't think I don't think so good. Okay, so when you're really clumsy like this, you've got to have a piece of half inch round stock or something laying around here, Travis. Well, no wonder I couldn't get that in there. My holes filled up with solder a little bit. How about a little round file, Travis? Over there, box. for a small commercial break. <laughs> well, 
That's why I said you said ribbon down in there much. So what we would do, I need, a, I need an assistant up here for just a moment. I need you to hold us together. Where are you walking? No, here. Yeah. Stand, stand, stand over there. I was asking. Stand over there. Keep that, keep that on the end. Just like that. So I've got my rivet in through my bar. I've got my through my candle cup. And now we have our candle cup riveted onto our cage. And if you turn orient this slit up against your upright, then, you know, most people are never going to see that. So there's our cage. There's completely assembled. Here's our legs. There's your candle stain. Now, one little finishing touch. Uh, I talked to you earlier about this little faceted ball up here. Uh, and how I just, when I loved that, I just fell in, fell in love with it and, and put it on everything. Uh, to, to, to do that, we'll have to take our upright and we're going to uh, run a die down over it. Can you show the, the camera that one, the one that's yes. finished? Thank you. Now, just like everything else we've talked about, this little faceted ball can be done a lot of different ways. Uh, I've watched uh, videos of people doing it where they've welded uh, material onto the end of a smaller bar to give them the mass they needed and then form that square. Uh, you get into big pieces like pump handles and and irons and things like that. I'm relatively certain that's the way it was done. What I've done, or how I do these small ones, <coughs> is I'll, form my, I'll, I'll forge my taper, and then I just run a little die over it. Uh, not that you have to do it that way, but that's a, that's a 1032 thread. And there's different ways to make these little balls. The ways that I made the ones for clat, you can forge them. This is a little 3 8 one that was forged on the end of a, a, a 3 8 rod. Uh, little work I find is more and more difficult for me to do. This one is made out of a, uh, uh, a piece of half inch square that I cut. And I had talked about uh, maybe doing a bigger one here. I'll let you guys decide if you want to do that or not.
out. You cannot put this finial on until you've got your cage assembled. That's one of the reasons why I why I threaded why I thread this on rather than just. Uh, and I'm just going to darken it up a little bit, and then we'll we'll talk about how to go about making it various ways. So now we have our legs, we have our upright that we've assembled onto our cage assembly. We use the tenon that's allegedly on the bottom of our legs, <laughs> rivet that together, add your little finial onto the top. and you've got your can holder. A bunch of simple steps that we need to put together. You know, and things that we can all learn from. Now, let's, and I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll fix this mess up and we'll have this assembled for, for our next iron in the hat. Let's talk about this faceted ball for a moment. Uh, Travis, have you got a piece of three-quarter square or one-inch square or anything we could put a neck on real quick in a hurry or five, even five-eighths? Square on the behind that sign in that book. I got a piece of three-quarter over here. It's about four foot long. No, I don't need four foot long. There might be something on that shoulder. Okay, here's, here's a piece of three-quarter. All right. Sir. Here, let me let me let me use this. Uh, where's your uh, over here? Travis says, "Oh no, he's looking at the tool." Have you got have you got a set of dies for this to cut a shoulder? Yeah, he does. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like not to fail in anything else today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, that was what I was trying to think of. Well, technical terms. I thought if we, if we did that a little big, bit bigger, it would be easier to see. But maybe I can explain it to you like this. If okay. <laughs> We're going to draw Okay, we're looking at our little pre-cut cubes that I made that I made uh, that little video out of. If you take each one of these flat surfaces and you lay them out or 
with four equal corners. Okay, so now we've got a square with that layout on each corner. The way I did this one the other day was I just, I done it on my belt sander. If you connect these corners on every corner, you wind up with that 14 faceted ball. If you on the top, you have to do it on the bottom. It's just, it's, it's, I mean, it's really no more difficult than that. Uh, we'll get this bar heated up and I'll do one hopefully big enough that you can see. Uh, here, we'll pass, we'll pass this little piece around that I played with. You know, we'll start this one this way. What's that shape called? <laughs> Steve, what's that shape called? I was just thinking I was going to have to look it up again. The last time you demonstrated one of these things, I figured it out. I've always called it a quad decahedron. Quads, four, decas, ten, fourteen sides. But like I said, there are teachers all over this land that will attest to my lack of paying attention to class. Clay, what do you call that ball? <laughs> Ow, how many sides? It has 14. 14? Or 14 facets. I know it is a deeper. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to Now like this, that piece, that, that piece that I'm passing around, uh, like I said, all I did was, you know, I net, I, I put a cut in that, just like when I started my tenon. I forged down to that cut, so basically I had a square ball on the end of that piece. And then I used my hammer and the anvil. And, and really, it's, I mean, like I say about a lot of things, I can't tell you how to do it if it's not easy. But when you've got your, your square, you just lay it on the edge of your anvil and you tap whatever point is facing up to you, and it flat, it, your hammer flattens that point out, and your anvil flattens the other point out. It's a tetradecahedron. A tetradecahedron? Yep. Here we go. And Dave could not only read it, he can pronounce it. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is good. All right, so this is about a three-quarter inch bar. I'm going to leave just a little bit shy of three-quarter inch. Ah, wrong way, dummy. Wrong way, dummy. Did that camera show we do? And I, I thank you all for uh, contributing to the Iron and the Hat that sent money to Richie. Uh, someone else that we need to thank constantly is Travis for letting us have our meetings at this building. Most groups do not have a facility this nice to have a, to have a meeting in. Uh, so the next time you talk to Travis, be sure and tell him thank you. Thank you it's, 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 that is that is part that is a great deal of the success of Athens Forge. That we have such a nice facility to meet in.
me take one more heat and clean that up a little bit and then it'll be much easier to see this size ball than uh, a big one or a small one. I've seen little candle holders like this that have uh, brass finials on them and even brass uh, uh, cups and pans. So just like just like anything else we all work on, I mean, the only limit to how fancy we make it is ourselves and the time we want to put into it. Uh, the day that we did this class, as if I remember correctly, it was it was fairly late in the afternoon before everybody got done. We only had four students. <coughs> okay, that'll that'll be good enough for what we need. So we've taken our half inch, our, our three quarter inch material. I've necked it down a little shorter than three quarters on that end uh, because it's going to, uh, if you make it three quarter in every dimension, when you forge them, they, they tend to come out oval rather than square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it warm and I'm going to work it on the edge of the anvil like this. And all I'm going to do is work on them points. Like I say about everything else, it's not easy, I can't show it to you. Other questions? Any questions? questions in uh, like I said this would be if your if your decor 
uh, leans towards colonial type decor, uh, or you know someone that has, this would make a nice little Christmas present. Uh, I don't know that we have all of the material here, but there's at least material you could start, you know, cages and uprights uh, here. Travis may even have some quarter by one by 12. Uh, so just make a nice little Christmas project. Uh, is it, are we having an open forge next month? Okay. Well, if if Mike if Mike's able, that'd be a good thing to do. But like I said, now this and this entire project, you know, uh, other than other than uh, drilling the small holes, you know, and drilling and tapping this thing, this is all you can do. All this in one of your two brick gas forges, you know, you can do it all with a coal forge and an anvil and a hammer uh, and a punch, you know. Uh, so there's not that big a thing to it. Thank you all for coming. Al, thank you. Other people on my work classes you have coming on, where to find information about that stuff? And okay, I think the only class scheduled right now is next Saturday, uh, through Athens Forge or through uh, Athens Community College on their uh, it's, it's Athens State University slash CLL and you got to register on there and I will tell you that as of yesterday they still had two openings for class okay so go to uh, Athens State University go to their continuing education uh, part of their site There'll be information on that. Uh, that's the last one I think that Travis and I have this year. I know Bird on the Mountain has already talked to me about some dates uh, next year. Uh, but I don't think I even put it in my phone yet. Oh, uh, Steve Williams. Steve Williams is going to be teaching a class at Burrett on November the 9th on animal heads. Think Wizard mountain, heads. Huntsville, Alabama. Right, Bird on the Mountain, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, again, go to their website, Bird on the Mountain, and you can find their folk school classes, and you can see what they've got scheduled and what's listed there. I also think Mike Lynn has a class there in November, early December, that's going to be a two-day class. So those are, those are three classes uh, in the area, you know, that's, that, that uh, are opportunities. Uh, again, we'll have our open, we'll have uh, our November meeting here, and go home and do it. Come here, and do it. Thank you all again.